Hello, everyone. Um, introducing myself, I'm uh, Raúl Rodríguez from COVID. Um, I work in the bridge section in Oslo. Um, I will do a presentation about the, um, something quite different uh, with respect to what we have seen before. This will be focusing tunnels uh, in the experience in the project of Fornevo in Oslo. And I will focus in the constraint effects. Uh, later on, uh, my colleague also from Kobe Audun will make a presentation um, about Teddy and Grasshopper uh, parameterization and the application in um, Homelvik Bridge, uh, very interesting launching bridge, and an uh, introduction of the Kobe as a company. But I will move forward directly to the technical to my technical part. Um, for Nebu, Metro Line is a uh, eight kilometers line between uh, the center of Oslo from Majorstuen to For Nebu. It has six stations. Um, one of the stations is uh, Lisaker, so very close to here, and uh, is where I will focus the, the presentation. Um, the Lisaker station, this is the, um, the how it looks, the structure of the of Lisaker. Um, is it has uh, technically it has clearly two separate uh, solutions. The one in the right side is a drainage solution, while the uh, left side is a um, waterproof solution. The difference is that in the drainage part uh, we we are basing the solution in the typical uh, classic tunnel solution in Norway that is to use a they usually call it umbrella it's just that they um, collect the water and drop it to the sides and pump it outside so in this case there is no uh, water pressure acting and uh, so there is it's not a big complexity in the structure to be designed well, in the um, left side, here we want to, to keep the, the water, we don't pump the water, we keep the same pressure. Uh, the reason is it comes from the geology engineers and is to, um, to have control of the settlements of the, when there is rings, risk of settlements in the surroundings, they prefer to go with this solution that is more expensive, but um, with minimum risk uh, of settlements. So here um, uh, we have, uh, in this case, in this particular station, we have 36 meters of water column in the lower part of the of the tunnel here. Uh, so um, the pressure will be quite high, and uh, we have this. The elements that we have here are the this main tunnel uh, that is covering the station hall and the transversal uh, tunnels that here this one is the um, entrance tunnel uh, the main entrance two escape tunnels uh, to the shaft uh, that give access from the street this will be near to the train station of Lisaker and is also watertight so all this both the all the tunnels and also the shaft is watertight with the same technical solution and this tunnel is the one that comes to, to Mustad, uh, to the other side of the um, river. Um, the typical detail is that one. So we are casting uh, concrete directly against the rock. Um, so if we could imagine that uh, when, well, we, it would be a, a waterproof membrane in between the, the rock and the, um, and the um, uh, concrete. But uh, we can imagine that the restraint that we get against the, the rock is very high and the um, shrinkage and temperature effects will induce uh, quite big restraint uh, forces because the, the concrete cannot move uh, due to restraint against the irregular uh, rock. Uh, in this sense, in the longitudinal direction of the tunnel, for example, we can think that we, we can, it's clear that we are not going to have any uh, loading or any major loading and then the only effect from the shrinkage will induce um, tension forces in the longitudinal direction 
and uh, and the through thickness cracking will be uh, something that we, we will leave, we will need to live with it it's impossible to avoid um, yeah so then the the membrane is the key element for the waterproofing but anyway we need to to control the size of the of the cracking um this uh, problem of the restraints forces is uh, is not something particular from Lissacker. It always happened when we cast a retaining wall uh, or an underground portal against an existing foundation. We have concretes of different age. Uh, the younger uh, concrete will always want to to shrink more than the existing one, and then we will get this uh, vertical. Uh, cracking or also here as shown in this picture usually in a standard um, structures what we usually do is just uh, use simplify rules uh, just maybe put more reinforcement maybe double the first one two meters of the wall and it's okay to control the shrinkage uh, in this sense uh, the euro code also has thought um, uh, is covering this effect by using this formula of the chapter seven. Um, the formula is based in uh, balancing the um, cracking force of the of the concrete with the stresses of the reinforcement until, uh, but um, uh, and putting as a limit uh, a level of um, stress in the reinforcement that give a control of our crack width. Um, so usually, if we want to do that. Uh, then we would need to balance with 200 megapascals of the of uh, stress in the reinforcement around more or less depend of some uh, the diameter and spacing of the bars but uh, this will give a very high reinforcement um, there are other approaches in the Denmark annex for example to this one that uh, gives a, a bit more accurate approach but also not uh, quite simplified and um, and the thing here is that apart from that it's not optimal is that here in Lisaker we have also a water pressure we don't have only, we don't have a retaining wall with any other uh, forces we have also water pressure um, up to 36 meters of water column uh, we have uh, some places with complex geometries this is the central part of the station where connects to the entrance tunnel this is the uh, end one of the ends of the station that connects to the train tunnels to the entrance for to Musta to this side of to the other side of the um, river to escape tunnel uh, a variable here we have a variable tunnel because uh, the rock here was at a lower level so to keep the, the deck the um, uh, to keep enough uh, rock depth, uh, we had to 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 reduce the the height of the tunnel. We have this shaft. So at the end, the geometry is complex. It has a quite three um, D component, and it happens in some places that the um, the same direction of reinforcement that is um, loaded by the water pressure is also having uh, shrinkage uh, effects. Um, then here we see the advantage in using a, a full analysis that uh, include everything but uh, to to do that we need to, to use a, a non-linear material um, uh, to show the method uh, i will use this quite simple uh, example but it's nice to, to go through the method but it has been implemented also in the other more complex geometries uh, this is the typical section of the tunnel. Uh, here is, in this case, is um, easy to divide, the, separate the, the analysis between trans the transversal direction, where the is the direction in which the water pressure forces flows, and the longitudinal direction, uh, where we have the shrinkage effects and temperature effects. In the transversal direction, the um, uh, method is quite standard. 
we use an elastic material. Um, we um, simulate the contact with the rock by using uh, springs that only are active in compression. Then the analysis is not linear in this sense, but only because of the springs, because uh, otherwise the, um, the rest of elements are elastic. Um, so we run uh, the tunnel um, in ASE, we get displacement, we get forces, uh, moments, axial shear forces, and we go later on to uh, BEMES to make a post-process and calculate the reinforcement. So quite a standard method. In the longitudinal direction, that is the main topic, um, here we have a problem uh, of SLS problem, can could we say, because it's, um, it's due to the cracking effects, due to shrinkage. Then is SLS what is going to SLS what is going to govern the design. Um, here to perform this analysis, we have um, we have a, a load, uh, we have a, a deformation due to shrinkage, to temperature. We have uh, we have to define uh, springs in the longitudinal direction in order to simulate the friction towards the rock. In this case, we could use two approaches in Sophistic. We could um, define a spring that is always active in the longitudinal direction, a uh, regular spring. But we could also use an approach based on a friction uh, uh, friction spring that on, only act, is activated when there is contact with the rock. In, in this case, we have used the first approach with only always active springs because it's conservative but also because due to the regular shape of the of the rock uh, we can think that also there is no contact uh, in some positions with the rock but we could always expect some restrict, uh, restraint in the movements anyway so we thought that it's more conservative just to have a, a spring that is always active independently if there is contact or not um, I will come back to the calibration of these springs later. Um, and of course, we need a nonlinear material. Why? Is, if we if we had tried to to use this um, approach with elastic material and we apply it to to a full restrain structure a deformation of uh, 0 0.3 per mil, uh, typical shrinkage value, to our thickness. Uh, for our thickness of the basement of 1.2 meters, the corresponding, uh, and, and we calculate the corresponding axial restraint force, this 13,000 kilonewton per meter, and we try to balance this with, um, with the reinforcement and control the stresses in order to control the crab width, then we would need three bars of 32, each 15 centimeters and size. So then we need to, we cannot use this, uh, this axial load, we need to, um, to do a good estimation of the stiffness by considering the cracking and uh, how the cracking is going to reduce the, um, the stiffness of the system. The, how is defined the nonlinear material in Sophistic? Um, the main parameter is the tensile strength. We have, based on the mean value, the characteristic value, here it could come to the question uh, what to use mean or characteristic. The characteristic value would give a smaller, uh, it's a smaller, then we would get more uh, cracking, then we would get um, lower stiffness and lower enforcement. So it, it's not conservative. Additionally, um, the um, formulation of crack in the euro code is always based in the mean value then uh, we we decided to go with this uh, mean value uh, it's important to consider the tension stiffening uh, the tension stiffening is the um, contribution to the stiffness of the system uh, given by the concrete in between cracks um, in the in Sophistic, the model that is used is, is comes from the German annex to the Eurocode 2. And 
uh, it takes as a starting point the the black curve of a strain uh, stress strain deformation of the steel and is its lift uh, in order to uh, in, uh, increasing the the stiffness of the steel reinforcement in order to take into account the tension stiffening so the tension stiffening is included in the analysis by have, by manipulating by adjusting the stiffness of the reinforcement by giving more and more stiffness to the reinforcement um, if we take a look to the stress to the uh, tension the stress uh, the formation curve of the concrete particularly to the um, tension part that is it looks like that it has a part first that go upwards or downwards depending on how you think towards the, ten the um, tensile strength and later uh, the standing part towards zero that is called the uh, softening usually called softening this is uh, related to the tension stiffening is the base of the phenomenon uh, so uh, as we are uh, including the tension stiffening in the um, by adjusting the curve of the of the reinforcement we uh, disable this softening part in order not to duplicate and put too much more um, stiffness in the system that would not be uh, realistic so we operate with this curve we come to the to the top tensile strength up down basically down directly to zero um, if we think how this works, um, uh, we have a, a tunnel that uh, to mobilize the restraint uh, that tries to shrink. So at the end, it it moves and it mobilizes the um, the friction, the restraint force, can, can we call? And the restraint force is mobilized in the first meters, and later is constant in all the tunnel. This is something that we could see here uh, this is these graphs uh, are showing displacement in the longitudinal direction in some sections along the tunnel and we always see that at the ends we have the higher displacement inwards and, and until we go to zero we move a little bit around zero but around zero always so these parts at the ends are the part that we need to mobilize the restraint force and later in the center is constant and stabilize. So this is the part where we will read the uh, results. Um, and it's based on this uh, behavior where we uh, calibrate the springs. We need to give enough uh, stiffness to the springs in order to get something like that. And about the script, um, is done in CSM, the main script here for the for this analysis. Uh, CSM, you may, you may know, is uh, CSM uh, prepare the scripts for ASE that uh, and, uh, and is ASE the real engine that calculate and solve the the um, analysis. But we we perform the script in CSM uh, about the, so I'm going to point up uh, the main script uh, related with this nonlinear analysis. To, we have to, to activate here the nonlinear analysis and in this uh, other control option the nonlinear material. Also here we define the number of iterations. The convergence, convergence criteria is also defined here by three kilonewtons in this example. So we allow an unbalance of three kilonewtons at, at each node, an unbalance force. Um, as this is a nonlinear analysis, uh, in concrete, we need to include the reinforcement in the analysis. So we need to uh, the reinforcement as an input. The reinforcement is defined through a design case of reinforcement. In this case, is design case number two defined here, um, and could be based in the minimum reinforcement, or could be based in a preliminary analysis, uh, more simplified without. Um, a shrinkage or without restraining forces. Uh, yeah, here we define the, the, the type of analysis that is serviceability analysis. 
and here we define uh, the important parameters of the concrete here this is the 3.8 megapascals is the mean tensile strength of the concrete of our concrete uh, the B45 that's the concrete um, this is the tensile st tension stiffening model um, the model is called 525 in sophistic and this parameter is uh, equal to zero in order to disable the softening, the descending part of the um, concrete uh, curve. About the shrinkage and creep uh, is also defined in uh, in CSM. It's nothing special from a regular linear analysis, but just that here was important to be precise and separate the starting points of the shrinkage and of the creep so uh, in the way that we have defined the shrinkage is, is uh, by in, in the group command uh, by making active the shrinkage from the very first day from the day number one because we just from the beginning when we cast against rock we can we, we start having the shrinkage effects while the creep is more related to the uh, constra constra uh, construction uh, phases. The creep is not very important in the longitudinal direction, but it is in the in this example. But it is in the transversal uh, due to the water pressure uh, the, that increases the, the, um, the formation in a uh, important way. So uh, here we assume that uh, uh, we unprop after seven days. Uh, then we activate after seven day we activate the self weight uh, and the after 28 days seven plus 21 we assume that we activate the water pressure this will not be the same in all the sections of course but in the last one maybe will be the the, the right one uh, they can activate the water pressure after 25 28 days so um, in this way, we give the information to Sophistic to calculate the creep factors associated bo uh, to the self weight and the creep factor associated to the water pressure in a proper way. Yes, how the, the shrinkage will be applied in uh, gradually in CSM in some phases. So this is pictures of uh, showing the cracks in different uh, stages and how they are increasing. Uh, so what happens here is that uh, when we apply a certain a shrink, a part of the shrinkage that give uh, to the first element um, stress up to the tensile uh, uh, strength, then it comes the first crack. Uh, at this element, we get a zero stress, this node, and then um, uh, the stress start increasing to the adjacent nodes until we arrive to the again to the um, tensile strength and we get a new crack. So this happened uh, as in the way that we are increasing the shrinkage in the different phases, we are having this phenomenon. And uh, th when this is happening, we are getting an adjustment of the stiffness of the system. And uh, and at the end, we get a final focus uh, after all the uh, when the shrink, final shrinkage is is uh, applied in the temperature where we read the results. We are only um, worry about what happened at the end. And about the verification, uh, it's important to mention that in this way of analysis, we are doing the um, verification inside the analysis inside ASE and we are not going to post-process anything uh, we are not going to post-process forces um, we have uh, I'm going to present two cases the case number one is uh, it's related to the tunnel that I have presented and is based on an almost pure uh, axial force uh, loading condition while uh, at the end, I will show an example from another model, case two, where we will have a combination of bending and axial. In the tunnel, in the longitudinal direction, as we have a axial, a pure axial force, 
uh, we prefer to calculate through the directly by hand um, the um, and using the euro code which could be the the stress in the reinforcement that could uh, be related to the crack width limit we have a crack width limit of 0 0.39 millimeters so the corresponding uh, stress at the um, at the bar in the in the basement of the tunnel with 1.2 uh, meters of thickness is 200 megapascal this is the limit of the reinforcement when we are uh, below this uh, stress in the reinforcement we know that we have lower crack width um, in the case of the vault of the tunnel the limit of stress is 150 megapascal uh, again in this we have also two two ways of proceed here we can have a fixed input of reinforcement uh, then in this case we give the input through a design case number two here where we form we give the, inform the input to sophistic that we have a reinforcement in the vault of 25 uh, bars each 15 centimeter and at the basement of uh, two bundle 20s each 15 centimeter at the outer face and two bundle 25s at the inner face and we check the, the um, the stresses. Other option would be to allow Sophistic to check the stress level in the bar by using the parameter CHQR, activating this parameter and giving the input to Sophistic that whenever, whenever you see a, a bar with a stress uh, higher than 205 megapascal, you have to increase the reinforcement in order to limit the, the, um, the stress to, at this level. Uh, the new reinforcement will be stored at a new design case, uh, number 98 in this case. As we are changing the reinforcement, we are changing the, the stiffness, and this is a nonlinear, but at, as this is a nonlinear analysis, and, it's, and all this is performed inside the, um, the iteration, uh, we, we will get a correct result. The new stiffness will be considered in the result, the resulting stresses. And um, about the results, this plot is showing the stresses in the concrete. In this particular view that I have chosen regards to the um, uh, inside face of the tunnel. So we are showing here the um, stresses in the inside face of the concrete. They are always in blue because they are always in tension and all these values are below 3.8 because this, these uh, values regards the elements that are not um, crack. The elements that are crack are not showing any stress, are in black. Yeah. This is maybe the most important uh, picture uh, of results. Uh, this is showing the uh, stresses at the reinforcement uh, sophistic shows the, the separate the inside and outside face, of course, this is the inside face, but it gives a, this, in the same picture the two directions, so we have to focus in the numbers in the orientated in the longitudinal direction that are the, the one that we are interested in this analysis. And we see values in blue, stress, it, mean, it means tension in the reinforcement, and we see stress values in red, so it means compression in the in some bars. I will come back to this the, the reason for this compression in the bars. Um, we can see here that the the str uh, bars that has the elements that has bars in tension are grouped in circular groups, uh, as one could be expected from the cracks. And, um, and as seen here, well, not very clear, difficult to read, but at least in this zoom uh, picture here, we can see that all the values are below the 200 megapascal in the basement, and in the vault are all below also 155 megapascal, which is validating the uh, chosen reinforcement, and indicating that the crack width is under the limit of 0 0.39. 
if we take a look to the results, but now from the viewer in ECSD in Sophistic, we pick this element here. We are picking an element. This is the face that belongs, that corresponds to the longitudinal direction. Uh, here we see that there is no stresses in the concrete, it's crack, and we see blue stresses in the reinforcement, is in tension. So this is a crack element. If we now pick an element a little bit inside, then in the longitudinal, in the phase corresponding to the longitudinal phase, we see that um, there is a steel tension in ten is there is still stress in tension in the concrete because this element is not crack, and there are uh, compression in the bars. So of course the element is um, the resultant force of the through the thickness of the element. If you, we sum the resultant from the concrete and the reinforcement, we, we are in tension. The resultant is in tension because this is uh, the only load here is the shrinkage and temperature that is put in tension. But internally, as this element is elastic, it's not crack, this, the shrinkage is put in some compression, a small compression in the bars. And this is why we have some elements with red values with, um, in the reinforcement with compression. And uh, this is uh, uh, another example of uh, another model where we have, this is what I call the case two, with where we can find bending and axial forces in the same element. Uh, I'm focusing now in the end wall of the station, this one. This end wall is getting uh, water pressure from the side. So it's putting this wall in bending in the vertical direction. At the same time, the tunnel is getting pressure from above and from below and this is transferred to the wall putting also compression in the in the wall then in the vertical direction of the wall we have a combination of bending and, and axial uh, so in this case to to try to to do a um, manual calculation of the of the crack width of the euro code is difficult and then we, we <coughs> just let Sophistic to calculate by himself uh, inside asset the crack width um, in this nonlinear analysis. And we arrive to crack width uh, also below 0 0.39 millimeters, val validating again the, the chosen reinforcement. Yeah, so just to finalize and um, present the participants here. The owner is um, an agency uh, called Forno Urbana or Food that is run by Oslo Comune and Viken, Vilkes Comune. The design team uh, is uh, a joint venture of Kobe and Multiconsul. And the architect is different for each station, but in the case of Lisaker, it was a joint venture of uh, Arup, Asplan, Viak, and uh, Longa Architecture. So, thank you.